And with that, I would like to introduce Ken Burns, who will introduce our speaker and our session for today. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, but he exacted a price for uh, coming today. And part of the price was I had to tell you how the Nobel laureates are picked. And uh, it may be a random process as far as I know, but technically what happens is that various components in Sweden and Norway pick specific winners of various prizes. And today's talk is about the 2021 prize in medicine and physiology. And that prize is picked by the faculty from the Karolinska Institute. And that's the only one that the Karolinska picks. The Karolinska is a private, not a private, sorry, a public uh, medical university just outside Stockholm. And large numbers of groups and individuals can nominate people every year. And then the uh, selection committee uh, at the Karolinska has the pleasure of sifting through all the nominations and deciding who could get the prize. And in 2021, they decided that uh, two people who had worked on uh, the sensors for pain and, I'm sorry, not pain, but touch, I guess, and pain uh, were worthy of the prize. That was rather a novel award after many years of molecular genetics and things like that. Uh, and so, uh, the prize was jointly awarded to um, David Julian, who's a professor at the University of California in San Francisco, and to Arman Padapudian, uh, who is a professor at the Scripps Institute in California. And I think uh, our speaker today will tell you uh, somewhat more about each of them. Our speaker is uh, Professor Bill Clem. Uh, Bill Kim, did I say Clem? I did say Clem. Clem used to be in my department also. So it's, whereas he was Bill Clem, this is Bill Kim. And so anyway, Professor Kim uh, graduated uh, from Swarthmore College and he went to graduate school at the University of Illinois in Champaign, Urbana. Uh, and received a master's degree and a uh, PhD, and then migrated to Duke University for two years uh, to do a fellowship. And uh, finishing his fellowship, I think he wanted to keep on moving further south, and so he became almost a charter member of the faculty at the University of Florida in the department of pharmacology. The man who hired him was a charter member, Dr. Marin, and Bill claims that the main reason he got hired was that he could give uh, Dr. Marin a good tennis game. Now, whether that's true or not, who knows? Dr. Marin is not here to contest that version of the story. But anyway, Dr. Kim is here this afternoon, and so I think before I do any more damage, it's his, it's his turn to give us his talk. Thank you. Welcome, Bill. Thank you for the introduction. I did know Bill Clem. He was a wonderful guy. Uh, he and I both went to Bimini in 1971. I helped him collect shark blood, and he sat in the boat while I collected sea anemones. And we went to some of the Hemingway's old haunts uh, and so on and so forth. So I was sorry to see him go to Jackson, Mississippi at one point. I thought it would be great to have a paper between the two of us. It could be Kim and Clem or Clem and Kim. All right. Um, I guess Ken uh, asked me to present this 
these awardees today because he couldn't find anyone else that knew anything about ion channels. Uh, and I must admit that I have spent some time working on ion channels, but uh, the ion channels we're going to discuss today were new to me, and I probably spent at least 60 hours preparing uh, a very short talk. And at the end, I decided that the best thing would be to let the Nobel Prize winners present to you themselves after I give a short introduction. And maybe there will be time for some questions afterwards. So anyway, I thought this was a, a, a cute little title from the New England Journal of Medicine, um, a sensational uh, research, because these people researched sensation. And while great progress has been made over the decades in learning how we see and how we smell and how we use most of our other senses. It was still a mystery until relatively recently in the last 25 years, shall we say, <clears throat> how we touch. Touch is very important to us, not only touching exterior objects, uh, a sharp uh, object will make us uh, reflexively uh, respond and get away from a dangerous situation, but our proprioceptors within our body also are mechanoreceptors of the same kind that we'll discuss today. <clears throat> um, our first uh, Nobel Prize winner, David Julius, uh, as Ken uh, mentioned, is, is a, uh, currently a Californian. Uh, but uh, then he moved, well, he, he moved actually from coast to coast. And I'll get into that in a moment. But first of all, let me just say uh, that the major uh, channel that we're going to discuss first is called a trip channel. This is a family of ion channels uh, that was originally discovered uh, from studying the uh, visual process in insects. And in 1969, the first paper was published. Uh, and uh, this was a recording of a response to light from the eye of the fruit fly, Drosophila. And you see the current at the top. <clears throat> here, here is the light pulse right here. So you see a transient response of current, which of course this uh, membrane potential change uh, greatly uh, reflects this. Um, and, and then you see it decaying away. So that's why it's called a transient response and it is a membrane potential depolarization of the sensory cell. And that serves to trigger a nerve impulse that then goes to the brain of this insect. Um, now let's move to the vertebrate nervous system. Here is a very uh, unrealistic diagram, excuse me, of a cross section of the spinal cord. And this is called the dorsal root. That's if we were to be on all fours, this would be dorsal. But anyway, as I'm standing now, my dorsal root is posterior. But anyway, anatomists call this the dorsal root ganglion because it has the cell bodies of sensory neurons. Now, the sensory neurons don't have this large a cell, a, a nerve ending, okay? This was expanded to, to, to show all these different transient re receptor potential ion channels that are involved, not only at the nerve ending, but also in our skin. And the fact that these channels, as you will see, respond to heat, chili peppers, uh, uh, pressure, uh, and cold, et cetera, okay? So um, <clears throat> these, this is where the sensory impulses, uh, nerve impulses go into the spinal cord and are processed and also 
are sent upwards to the brain so that we respond to these various stimuli, which include heat and cold and pressure, which we'll talk about today. Okay, so um, this year's laureates uh, basically concentrated on uh, thermal receptors on the left, shown on the left and uh, mechanoreceptors shown on the right. And uh, these look very diagrammatic, but we now have actual uh, fine structure details of these uh, channels, and you can see that they're quite different. Uh, here are some of the medical uh, and functional consequences of our sensing temperature and heat. Okay, uh, body temperature can be affected. What is it? Okay, <clears throat> well, uh, we have uh, visceral pain problems. So um, again, if you put your finger on a hot stove, you'll quickly withdraw it. If your if your thermal receptors are behaving, but if they're not, you will get burnt. And there are some people who unfortunately have mutations in uh, either the genes for these ion channels or uh, genes for sodium channels that are also involved in the sensation in response to pain, full stimuli. Okay, and then as I've mentioned, uh, we have various types of, of touch uh, and proprioception interior uh, sense, I couldn't be standing here without my proprioceptors telling me uh, that I'm in the position I want to be in. But these uh, ion channels are also, it turns out, involved in respiration, uh, sensing blood pressure, and in skeletal muscle remodeling. So um, this is quite an interesting field and has something to do with uh, with uh, why, uh, <clears throat> why these um, scientists receive the Nobel Prize for their... So here, here is um, Dr. Julius. Um, Dr. Julius started out in the public schools of Brooklyn, uh, did his PhD at the University of California, and then postdoc at Columbia, uh, and then returned to UCSF 1989, where he is now a professor. And, and we'll talk about his work in great detail. Um, David uh, is, I'll just call him by his first name. <clears throat> I did meet him once at a meeting in Miami. So uh, he probably doesn't remember me, but I remember him particularly now. Uh, <clears throat> we were at a meeting on animal toxins and you'll see that he studies animal toxins as well. Okay, um, chili peppers contain a substance called capsaicin that uh, makes us feel very hot and we get a burning cessation. I discovered this when I was waiting for the school bus at the age of six with a bunch of neighborhood kids, one of whom had a sack of chili peppers. And I didn't know that I was being uh, asked to, to bite into such a pepper, but I did. And I apparently had excruciating pain because when I got to school, I apparently tattled on, on him and my three older brothers and they had to go to the principal's office and, and try to defend their actions. But anyway, um, I haven't had a great desire to, to eat chili peppers since then, but Perhaps uh, as my sense of taste and smell erodes, I will try them again. Um, Dr. Julius used chili pepper capsaicin as a tool to, uh, to find within a cDNA library expressed in a cultured cell system to find this first uh, trip channel called trip V. It's called V because capsaicin is a vanilla vanilloid compound 
uh, a chemist would notice that from looking at its structure. Okay, so they were able, taking a cDNA library of, of um, made from RNA that was found in the dorsal root ganglion cells, the, the axons in the cell bodies, uh, to, to finally find this first uh, trip channel. Uh, I don't know why the, it's working now. Okay. <laughs> Just your presence makes it work. <laughs> okay. Uh, so anyway, Dr. Julius ha had a student uh, uh, who went through many, many uh, days of negative experiments before they finally found uh, a particular cDNA that expressed the ion channel that responded to capsaicin. And this is called TRIP-V1. Uh, another ion channel was subsequently found uh, that responds um, at, at temperatures above 43 degrees centigrade. 37 centigrade, of course, is our normal uh, body temperature. <clears throat> so um, subsequently, several other TRIP channels that are responsive to temperature were found and they have ranges of responsiveness that vary so that we this provides us with a continuum of, of responses to um, thermal stimuli. Our second Nobel Prize winner, Artem Pataputian, was born in Beirut and uh, attended public schools there, but uh, uh, was able to uh, leave the uh, war-torn country of Lebanon to come to LA, and he received his PhD in, from the Cal from Caltech. <clears throat> then he became a postdoctoral fellow at UCSF. Uh, now he's at Scripps in La Jolla. He has um, also studied sensation, but. He has specialized in, in ion channels that respond to pressure um, of, of various sorts. And they were fortunate to find uh, a, their first pressure receptor expressed uh, in, in a neuroblastoma cell line. This gene was number seven, the 72nd one that was studied. Um, so I imagine the graduate student was probably getting a little nervous about how long it was going to take to get their PhD, but they finally found the gene, and uh, it was called piezo-1. Uh, the Greek word piezo apparently means pressure. Um, subsequently, they found a very similar uh, channel, called, which they called piezo-2, as shown here. And you'll see that these piezo channels look very different from, from the trip channels that I showed you before. They cause an indentation in the cell membrane, and they have uh, a big structure right in the middle here, which apparently is important for closing the channel. But when there's a pressure generated here on the lipid bilayer aspect of the membrane or the entire membrane of the cell, <clears throat> that apparently allows this channel to, to open up transiently. And so we have the sense of touch as shown here, as well as proprioception. Okay, this just summarizes uh, how, how they found uh, their respective channels, but I think we've already described it. Uh, they use molecular biology, they used uh, in the case of Julius Lab, they used a cDNA uh, library, and then they used calcium imaging, uh, a dye that responds to an increase in intracellular calcium called FURA2, uh, also uh, from Richard Chen's lab in California, uh, to, to identify the cells that responded. These transient receptor channels are generally non-selective cation channels. That, that allow sodium and calcium and magnesium to flow through them. And so that means that when they're open, the cell membrane goes from a state of its normal resting potential of about a tenth of a 
volt negative on the inside to about close to zero. <clears throat> but that's, that's not sufficient uh, to travel to the spinal cord by itself, but that serves as a kind of like a stimulus for the nerve impulse generating ion channels, the sodium and calcium, sodium and potassium channels to respond. Then um, Dr. Patapudian's lab uh, used other methods, including uh, uh, silencing RNA to uh, determine which uh, of the RNAs uh, were responsible for generating these piezo channels. You see, no, no uh, current response occurred in this cell, whereas you got current responses to the cells next to it. So that meant <clears throat> that um, the silencing RNA could silence that, that, so that was the, the gene to follow. Okay, now I want to treat you to, I want to introduce Dr. Julius himself. This was not a special recording. This was his Nobel uh, address uh, presented uh, by Zoom in December at the unique contributions of some exceptional individuals whose discoveries in the words of Alfred Nobel have conferred the greatest benefit to humankind. Within physiology or medicine, the ultimate goal is to uh, achieve scientific breakthroughs that significantly deepen our understanding of health and disease. The discoveries we celebrate this year are stellar examples of this, such uh, breakthroughs. Presentation is an hour and a half. Today, so it's, it's an honor the introduction. For me to extend my warmest congratulations on behalf of Karolinska Institute to David, Julius, and Artem Patapuzian. They share the 2021 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for the discoveries of receptors for temperature and touch. I felt very clearly that uh, we humans, we do have receptors that react to. Now give the floor to um, Abdel El Manira, professor of neuroscience and a member of the Nobel Assembly, who will introduce this year's laureates. Please, Abdel. I welcome you all to the 20th Silence in experimental analysis, he succeeded in identifying the gene encoding the elusive mechanosensitive channel that he named piezo after the Greek word pressure. Piezo channels provide us with the sense of touch, to feel the texture of objects, and to monitor the position of reason obliges that I Berkeley, California, University of California, Berkeley, and Professor Audison for hosting this, these lectures. Uh, and I'd like to thank the Nobel Foundation for their creativity in putting this hybrid celebration of Nobel Week together, which at least allows us to enjoy one another's company in some form uh, during this still challenging pandemic times. And of course, I'd like to thank the Nobel Assembly for uh, bestowing this tremendous honor upon me and my co-laureate, uh, Artem, uh, who I am very pleased to share, with whom I'm very pleased to share this prize. Uh, and in a larger sense, I'd like to thank the uh, Nobel Assembly for recognizing the field of pain and somatosensory research, uh, which has um, brought great excitement to the field, to our laboratories, to our institutions, uh, and even to the many patients around the world who suffer from chronic and persistent pain syndromes. So that's actually a good place to start. 
because much of what we've, uh, our motivation for what, much of what we've learned over the last few years has been to ask questions about pain and pain mechanisms and understanding pain. So pain, of course, is a submodality of somatic sensation, the sensation that we colloquially refer to as touch. And uh, I often argue that among our five senses, uh, um, somatic sensation and pain is probably the most important for our survival and well-being. Uh, and that's because pain serves as a main warning and protective system that tells us when we have or are about to experience bodily injury and to initiate appropriate protective reflexes. Um, and in people who, in whom this system is rendered inoperable due to genetic mutations or diseases, uh, those individuals are at great risk of bodily injury or death. The problem is, of course, is that uh, while pain is incredibly uh, useful and necessary as an acute warning system, it often outlives this phase and instead becomes persistent and debilitating. Uh, and the goal uh, is to understand this switch between acute and chronic pain, uh, ultimately with the hope of preventing or reversing that. Now, another challenge, I think, in the pain field uh, in the long run is to better define different pain syndromes to ask how cr different chronic pain syndromes differ, cellularly, molecularly, in terms of the circuitry, uh, and to understand what the underlying molecular mechanisms are, because I think until we do that, uh, we won't be able to adequately treat different pain syndromes. Um, so let me begin by, uh, by just giving a very brief overview of the pain pathway. Of course, pain, like other sensory systems, involves the detection of uh, peripheral stimuli, environmental stimuli, as well as some endogenous stimuli. Uh, and this occurs at the tips of primary afferent or sensory nerve endings uh, that transduce this information then to the central nervous system, first to the spinal cord uh, and ultimately to the brain where we perceive what's happened peripherally as a noxious or painful stimulus. Uh, in my lab, we focused uh, um, mostly at uh, understanding what happens here where pain begins at the periphery in these primary afferent nerve terminals, uh, and, uh, and which in aggregate are really remarkable cells. And why are they so remarkable? Because they must, they, they're tasked with the job of being able to detect a wide range of stimuli that include uh, physical stimuli like changes in pressure and temperature, which is really sort of the focus of the lectures you'll hear, hear today, uh, as well as other things in our environment such as um, noxious chemical agents, uh, as well as agents that are produced in our body uh, in the, as a consequence of, uh, of tissue or nerve damage. And what's remarkable about these uh, sensory nerve endings is that they have uh, mechanisms, receptors, for sensing each and every component of the so-called inflammatory soup. And of course, the purpose of this is to heighten the sensitivity of the primary afferent nerve terminal as part of the guarding response to tell us when we have uh, experienced injury so that we can protect that area. So it really changes the gain of the nerve fiber. Uh, and the goal in my lab, in many labs in this, uh, uh, in this area, is to understand how all these different stimuli focus in on the primary afferent nerve terminal, including physical stimuli and chemical stimuli, to regulate its excitability under normal conditions and under conditions uh, following injury. Now, studying these mechanisms, especially 20 or 25 years ago when we began this, was somewhat challenging because the genetic uh, and other tools to, uh, to identify molecules and mechanisms involved uh, were, uh, were lacking. And so we turned to an approach and that is to really exploit natural products and, and in some sense folk medicine to use uh, tools, pharmacological tools from these systems to, uh, to try and identify and probe mechanisms that are involved in pain sensation. And I sort of refer to this as pharmacology honed by evolution and I've always been fascinated by this because studying natural products in folk medicine is really sort of the nexus uh, where human behavior, chemistry, uh, and neurophysiology come together. And I think some of the uh, examples that have really inspired me and other people in this field uh, come from some of the following individuals. For example, Saul Snyder's uh, brilliant use of morphine and other opiate uh, alkaloids to discover opiate receptors. Um, the work of Sir John Vane, who explored the role of, of aspirin and salicylic acid uh, as a product of the willow bark. Uh, as, which we know is an analgesic, and through that route discovered the existence of cyclooxygenases and prostaglandins. Uh, and then Raphael Mahulam in Israel, who uh, asked what the psychoactive ingredient in marijuana uh, is, and identified THC uh, as the active psychotropic component, 
and then went on to identify endogenous endocannabinoid-like compounds, namely anandamide and 2-AG, through this kind of route. Uh, I've always been fascinated by this approach, and I think this has served as inspiration for many of us who, uh, who have taken this route of exploiting natural products in folk medicine uh, as a way to explore endogenous mechanisms of neural signaling or even cardiovascular signaling uh, in, the, in, the human, in human physiology. And, you know, I would add that what's really beautiful about this approach is that um, if you think about it, these agents still uh, represent the foundation of the two main groups of analgesic agents that we use today, namely uh, opiate analgesics and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So this is a very powerful approach. Now, we've uh, sort of turned this um, coin over on its other side, and instead of asking how natural products work uh, to deliver analgesic uh, relief, we've asked uh, how natural products work that serve as to induce pain, that serve as irritants. And the granddaddy in this uh, field is really capsaicin, the main pungent ingredient in chili peppers. But there are also other plant-derived irritants, including menthol from mint leaves, uh, and these compounds, the so-called isothiocyanates and thiosulfonates, that represent the pungent irritants in wasabi, members of the mustard family of plant, allium plants such as onions, uh, shallots, garlic, etc. Um, now, uh, in this regard, there are really two groups, when I went back and thought about this, whose work really influenced our approach, specifically in regard to using these plant-derived uh, irritants. And one of these is the uh, brilliant work of Jansko and colleagues, together with his wife, Aurelia Jansko-Gabor, uh, whose team were really the first to use capsaicin at the University of Zeged in Hungary uh, as a chemical probe for a subset of sensory neurons that, uh, that turned out to be very important in pain sensation. So they showed uh, in the 1950s and 60s that uh, exposure, uh, that capsaicin served as a, as a very selective excitatory agent for a subset of primary afferent nerve fibers uh, that are dedicated to pain sensation, the so-called nociceptors. Uh, and they further show that exposure of these, of sensory neurons to capsaicin, especially at high doses, led to a functional desensitization of these cells, as well as to their, ultimately, to their, uh, to their death. Uh, and furthermore, they showed that animals uh, in injected with a bolus of capsaicin would show a very profound decrease in their core body temperature, which is probably why we like to eat hot peppers in hot climates, because it leads to a uh, a centrally mediated, uh, hypothalamically mediated cooling of the body through vasodilation and sweating. But that also um, suggested that whatever the mechanism of capsation, capsation might be on the primary afferent, that this somehow was involved in sensing external temperature and reporting this information to the CNS. The other group that, uh, that greatly influenced our work uh, was that of uh, Ingve Zotterman, uh, together with um, Herbert Hensel, who did that work actually at the Karolinska Institute. Here's a picture of Zotterman in 1926 speaking with Lord Adrian outside the Karolinska Institute during a physio physiological conference. Uh, and what Hensel and Zotterman showed was that menthol um, has a very specific action, on a, again, on a subset of nerve fibers in the cat tongue, uh, and that the actions of menthol as an excitatory agent could be suppressed by warming or enhanced by cooling. And together, these observations uh, suggested that the psychophysical effects of these natural products are mediated through the selective action on somatosensory nerve fibers. Uh, it also suggested uh, later on to many of us that if one could define the molecular targets for these natural products, that this would reveal some important endogenous mechanisms of pain and or temperature sensation. So later on, uh, the focus really uh, in, in ensuing years was really on understanding how capsaicin works. In about the 1990s, uh, um, a number of scientists, particularly at the Sandoz Institute at the University of College London, began to ask how capsaicin works from a biophysical perspective. So they patch clamp sensory neurons, uh, and they had data to suggest that what capsaicin does is to enhance the permeability of the membrane of sensory neurons to uh, both mono and divalent cations. And the presumption was that capsaicin acts upon a receptor and or an ion channel uh, that mediates these effects, uh, and that the selective actions of capsaicin might uh, be a consequence of the expression of such a receptor on these cells. Although I have to say, at this time, there were also uh, um, uh, uh, competing ideas that capsaicin works more non-selectively 
by integrating into the membrane and somehow forming uh, um, some kind of, a, of an ion permeation pore. Um, but this set up a number of questions, obviously, in the, in the 80s and 90s uh, that harken back to the questions that were raised by uh, Jansko and by Hensel and Zotterman, and that is, do natural irritants target specific sites on sensory nerve fibers? What's the molecular nature of these putative receptors, if they do exist? Uh, and, and if they do exist, can we use these as molecular tools ultimately to ask if they mark functionally distinct sensory neuron subtypes? In particular, are they good probes for marking subsets of neurons that the presumptive nociceptors that are involved in either temperature or pain sensation. Uh, and really the biggest question is what are the endogenous physiological roles to such molecules if they exist? Obviously, we don't have these uh, putative receptors in our body just so we can experience the culinary wonders of spices. What are their roles in normal physiologic uh, um, circumstances? And this really set up uh, a, what we often refer to as the holy grail of molecular pain research at the time, which was to find the capsaicin receptor. Uh, and this grail was really reached when Mike Katarina joined my lab, he's now at Johns Hopkins Medical Center, uh, when he took on the, the, the challenge of cloning uh, what we hoped would be a gene encoding the capsaicin receptor. And, and he had a very simple approach, which is to take somatosensory neurons from a mouse or a rat, uh, and generate a cDNA uh, library, expression library from these cells in mass, and then to introduce those, these into non-excitable, non-neuronal cells, in this case, so-called HEK293 fibroblasts. And the idea was that if capsaicin really acted on some kind of a receptor or a channel that increased uh, intracellular calcium, uh, as, as people like uh, Humphrey Rang and Stuart Bevan had suggested, that we could detect this with uh, the calcium-sensitive dyes developed by the late Roger Chen. Uh, and so what we did was load these cells with these cal the calcium dye called Fira, introduce capsaicin, and we looked for cells that glowed, presu uh, which presumably had taken up a cDNA clone that allowed them to express a receptor that rendered them sensitive to capsaicin. And indeed, Mike was able to do this, and he succeeded in this. This was somewhat, of course, of a eureka moment. Uh, and he showed through sequencing and uh, together with Makoto Tamanaga and others in my lab that this gene encoded, in fact, an ion channel that has permeability to both mono and divalent cations. A couple of years later, oh, and I should also say that, um, that pharmacologically what Mike was able to show is that, uh, in fact, this receptor is a great reporter for pungency. So if you uh, ask how this receptor responds to extracts from chili peppers, uh, 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 ionic currents go through this receptor uh, respond in direct proportion to the perceived pungency of the chili pepper using capsaicin as a, uh, as a standard. Uh, and so in essence, we now had a molecular reporter that was a, a substitute or a mimic of the so-called Scoville units, uh, which are classically used to report pungency. I'm going to move Now a couple forward. of years later, uh, Dave McKemmy joined my lab and together with Werner Neuhaus, I encourage you to go to the Nobel Prize site and see the rest of his lecture. Um, but I want to let the second Nobel laureate speak for a few minutes. It's a very interesting lecture, but um, much too long for today. Um, I guess the second lecture must be on a different, um, maybe we should let the, <clears throat> let the audience um, go to the Nobel site to find the second laureate. Um, his address is very interesting as well, but shorter than Dr. Julius, and he, he uh, has, <clears throat> been the person who has given us uh, insight into how we touch and proprioceptive. Uh, so please, please, uh, on your own, find the Nobel Prize site and, and at your leisure and enjoy the address that was given. Ken, would you like to make some comments about um, Nobel Prize and how it's chosen. I do have a question here. You want me to? Okay. John Rice, can I see your hand? Just hold on a few minutes. So, actually, you may remember 
I already gave that part of the talk before you started. <laughs> so. Well, I thought you might have some more to say about it. I read an article, for instance, that said that because of the enlargement of the biomedical sciences, that they really should uh, have more than one Nobel Prize in the area of biology. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure that the physicists and the chemists might disagree and say that their field is expanded also and re requires that. But I can think of s several people that might have uh, actually uh, received the Nobel Prize along with these two individuals who are who clearly are uh, deserving. I think that's always the case. And, uh, you know, one, one could argue that uh, you mentioned uh, Saul Schneider and uh, he could have been a good candidate. Mm -hmm. op opioid receptors, there were people like Vernon Moncastle and Hopkins and, uh -huh. uh, and Albert Leninger. But right. that was true all across the scientific spectrum. And so these choices are completely arbitrary. Generally, most people do not uh, argue about the, um, the merit of the individual who receives the award. Uh, most of the time, <clears throat> but uh, where you get the complaints are that how come so-and-so wasn't included? And of course, there's a limit uh, of how many people can receive the prize. And the, the limit is three in any uh, given year. And what, and what they do, for instance, as a member of the National Academy of Sciences, Every year you get a request from the Swedish folks asking whether or not you have anybody you would like to nominate. So they get a large number of nominations, especially from institutions that want to, uh, mm -hmm. from, from institutions that want to promote sure. their own faculty, right. et cetera. And it's important to note that you cannot nominate yourself. Yes, that somewhat limits the numbers <laughs> of nominations. So I think that uh, Bill would be happy to answer any questions he can. So at this point, who has, and does it, ah, yes, John Reiskin has a question. Yeah, let me point, point out that at our last lecture, the sixth lecture, we will de be talking about some of the controversies or controversies, um, and also some of the uh, uh, detailed procedures because each prize has its own details, its own uh, 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 committee, uh, and there has been scandals among other things. Uh, but I have a question about um, TRPV1, which is the, uh, the channel for chili pepper, capacin, or however it is uh, pronounced, and then TRPM8, which seems to be the one for temperatures above 43 degrees Celsius. Um, uh, so here are two channels uh, for the, this pain receptor uh, of sorts. Um, and so this, uh, this is for a bit, um, whether uh, the, the, it interests the, the pain of a strong chili pepper would be the same as if you were being uh, um, in an intensely warm room. In other words, while the receptors are different, uh, the receiving structures within the brain are the same, and therefore uh, you think uh, your body temperature is getting too high, and then you sweat and uh, get that uh, flushed look, et cetera, and all the other consequences of, of heat. Um, so, well, there are two, yeah, there are um, two channels here. The, uh, let me just insert a 
comment. <clears throat> the trip V1 that Dr. Julius right. originally discovered uh, responds to various stimuli, heat, uh, lower pH, and to the capsaicin type compounds. Mm -hmm. So uh, th that uh, these are multimodal uh, receptive ion channels. They respond to various noxious stimuli uh, peripherally. So, so uh, this actually is happening at the ion channel. The capsaicin uh, makes it more likely that this temperature sensing channel will open at I normal see. temperatures. I see. Um, how, uh, and, and this is to the, to the calcium uh, ions initially, you said you pointed out. Um, so uh, sodium and calcium both flow right. into the cell. So we have these two polarizes. channels. What? We have these two channels, and I'm sure they've done uh, sequencing, uh, genetic sequencing to know the actual oh, yeah. makeup sure. of them. How many other TRP channels have been identified? Uh, I think we, the human genome, I think has about 30 of them. Okay. Uh, and, we, yeah. Probably five or six of them are thermal uh, and so on and so forth. There are still uh, some of these channels to be identified as to what their function is. So this has really opened up a whole new field. I should mention, by the way, that trip channels have a common st molecular structure that's very similar to that of potassium, uh, voltage-dependent potassium channels. Mm -hmm. I'm more familiar with, actually. Uh, they, they consist of four like proteins that aggregate in the membrane to form a donut-like structure where the pore is in the middle. Mm -hmm. but the, four segments of the donut are actually different strings of, of polypeptide chain. In the case of the trip channels, the, the, the four different monomers are usually identical, but sometimes you can have so-called heteromeric uh, channels, which are mixtures of, of different monomers to right. make, make the four, okay? I should mention before you leave that one of the trip channels also is the target of spider toxins. I know I, that I was you're, gonna, that I was you're a spider that. man, so I wanted to, to that, make sure you realize that. Yeah, that is, that is interesting. And I think we've spoken before about this, but the, because a certain spider toxins have the same effect, the sense of great pain, but also heat, mm -hmm. uh, sense of, of heat, uh, and I'm just wondering, do would you say that all mammals pretty much share the same? Um, the same. So that, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. One of the things I wanted to mention, this has direct consequences for all of you people who like to feed birds. Okay, uh, I put out a nice uh, bird seed construction, and the squirrels attacked it in no time. However, squirrels are mammals like us. And so if capsaicin is incorporated with the bird seed, the squirrels will leave it alone, but the birds love it because they don't have uh, receptors that are sensitive to capsaicin. So here is an interesting application of what Dr. Julius was discussing. And another interesting thing is that, for instance, vampire bats, which have to sense where the blood vessel is so that they can suck the blood of their, their victim, or pit vipers, snakes that have to detect their prey uh, with heat sensations. They also have trip channels that are, that, that are sensitive to thermal gradients. So um, this is a whole interesting group of ion channels that we're just learning about. And I think that not only biologically they're interesting, but also clinically, uh, eventually there will be new drugs that can help us treat 
various kinds of persistent pain. Interesting. So pit vipers, those pits might have their That's own. Right. They do. Yeah. Wow. And David Julius's lab has studied that as well. <laughs> wow. Tremendous. Well, thank you. That I sure. thought your explanation of it at the beginning was excellent. And uh, boy, what we're learning with molecular and genetic stuff is just fascinating. One of the interesting things that I didn't have a chance to talk about is, is the new method of structure determination of these very complicated complexes of proteins. This is done by what is called cryo-electron microscopy. X-ray diffraction is the classical method for, for determining the structure of proteins. But in order for that to happen, you have to crystallize the protein, and that's very difficult. It was, it was a new method was, dis, was discovered where you use electron microscopy at low temperatures, and, and, and it's possible to get re relatively good resolution structures, not quite as good as with X-ray crystallography, but good enough to, to see different polypeptide chains and to get an idea of the complexity of these uh, ion channels. It turns out the piezo channels, uh, instead of being tetramers like the TREP channels, the piezo channels are, are, have three monomers aggregated together. And each monomer has something like 10 times as many uh, protein uh, sequences that go in and out of the uh, lipid bilayer. So uh -huh. they're enormously complicated uh, pressure receptive uh, ion channels. But anyway, the, these new methods are, I'm sure that they're, if there haven't already been Nobel prizes for cryo-electron microscopy, there will be in the near future. Good, thanks. Yep. Any other questions? Okay, what, you have one here in the Oak Room. Uh, it seems that the research shows uh, relationships between stimuli and acute pain, but the doctor also spoke about uh, possible discoveries relating to chronic pain. Is there any way to, that this is being connected or being done? Because there's, there's no is stimuli. You, I, don't, I don't believe there's much stimuli for chronic pain. Um, I'm not particularly expert in this area. Um, but, but as Dr. Julia said, that uh, acute pain can, can lead to chronic pain. Um, the mechanisms underlying that are not completely clear. And so so I, I, don't, I don't think I should speculate on it, but there's a huge literature on it, of course, but it's, it's an area of ongoing research. It's very important. Any other questions here or online? Ken, anything else? Oh, here we have. I was wondering about peripheral neuropathy. Are peripheral neuropathies proximal to the uh, sensory uh, thing? Uh, or are there uh, peripheral neuropathies that are based on injury to the receptor itself? I think there are peripheral uh, neuropathies that are associated with defective functioning, either hypersensitivity or whatever of, of these uh, of these ion channels. The the these trip channels are largely associated with the nerve endings of the sensory neurons. Okay, these are these are small my, unmyelinated neurons called C fibers, and um, <clears throat> besides being unusual in having these um, touch and thermal receptors, these particular ax axons also have uh, sodium channels that are different from what are found in motor axons. And uh, it's possible to, to also possibly treat chronic pain and, and, and peripheral neuro neuropathic pain uh, by reducing the number of impulses that reach the spinal cord through these pain fibers. Uh, Bill, that was very interesting. I learned something, but 
My question is very basic. Some people can eat a lot of chili peppers and others can't tolerate even a little bit. Is the difference in the receptor or is it in these ion channels or is it in transmission of the impulse, do you know? Um, I, th I think what, what happens um, to uh, people who like to eat uh, hot food with, with, with capsaicin in it is that the receptors become desensitized um, they don't I, don't, I don't think they make a different receptor. Although it turns out, for instance, that a very closely related receptor to V1, namely V2, is insensitive to capsaicin. So uh, it, it's conceivable that, that, uh, that the receptive V1 might be eliminated and the V2 it would become more prominent. Uh, that's why people want something that's even hotter because they lose their sensitivity. A friend of mine from Israel and I were at a Chinese restaurant eating Sichuan chicken. And I said, Ernest, you see those little red things? Avoid them. And of course, the next thing I looked, he was biting into one, you know, that's the usual response of an Israeli. And uh, he got a look on his face. And after about five minutes, when he could talk again, he said, 40 years in the Middle East had not prepared him for that sensation. <laughs> All right, John, last question. Yeah, just one brief question. Um, incidentally, with regard to Sichuan chicken, I almost, uh, lost my mother-in-law that way um but um is that good or bad john <laughs> it, uh, a mixed issue um bill uh, i wanted to ask about um you asked you said uh, now that you're no longer a six-year-old you be willing to try a, a, a chili pepper again because your tastes uh, may have eroded and i'm one and how does age affect uh ability to taste. I'm not talking about COVID. I'm talking mm -hmm. about age here. Uh, well, I don't know. Um, there, I, I live in a department uh, in which many of my colleagues study smell, uh, but not too many of them study taste. But I'll, I'll try to find the answer okay. for you. And, and we can commu communicate later about that. Yeah, there is a woman a very famous scientist who's here at the university. I can't quite remember. Anyway. I don't know him. Yeah. Has a different, somewhat different name. Yeah. Yeah. Bartoshuk. Bartoshuk. She's the person who can give you a very straight answer on that. Uh, Thanks very much. On that question. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you for attending. Next, next week, we have a, uh, an engaging speaker who's been here before, uh, Dr. Uh, Purich, who's going to talk about the prize in chemistry. <laughs>